Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you. We're so glad that you're with us. We want to again welcome our brethren from Kent. I'm sorry that they're doing construction and you can't get in your building, but we're really glad to have you. <laughs> and we welcome you back at any time. We have several visitors, and uh, we want you to know how glad we are that you're here with us today. And we ask you again, please fill out a visitor card for us. Uh, so we can have a record of your visit with us. In a Messianic prophecy, in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, Malachi wrote in regard to Jesus, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. There, notice that the Messiah, the Son of God, is referred to as the Son of Righteousness, spelled S-U-N. And I think this alludes to the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, would be a light, or the light of the world. Hence the passage which was just read for us in John 1, verses 6 through 9, where in talking about John the Baptist, it says that he came to bear witness of the light, and that the true light actually is a reference to Jesus, and that John's purpose was to come and bear witness of the light that Christ would give to the world. And we know, of course, in passages such as John 8 and verse 12, that Jesus described himself as the light of the world. And hence, as we go through this PowerPoint lesson today, I have Jesus on our chart depicted as a light that is shining. As we go through our daily lives, there are numerous clubs and organizations of which one might be a member. Recently, I am, I'm not right now, but recently I have been a member of the Portage County Beekeepers. And uh, there are certain requirements to get into that club. And sometimes these clubs have a lot of requirements and sometimes... They don't have very many. Portage County beekeepers, I don't even think you have to be a beekeeper. You just give them a couple dollars and you go to a meeting and you're in the club, okay? But we know that some clubs have very strict and very difficult guidelines. For example, I don't think I would ever be admitted to the United States Olympic team. I don't think I could ever qualify to be a member of that club. And so there are different clubs and organizations that we sometimes strive to be a part of. But what I want to talk to you about uh, this morning is the most important organization that you could ever be a part of, and that is to be in Christ. And I want to think a little bit this morning about what it means to be in Christ. What are some of the blessings that come from being in Christ? And then... At the end of the lesson, what I want to do is I want to look at the requirements for getting there. How we get into Christ so that we can enjoy all the blessings that are found therein. First of all, and, and there are, I'm sorry, but there are 14 points, okay? And I'm going to move through these rather quickly uh, as we go through this lesson. But there are 14 different things that I want to bring out that are found only in Christ. And number one, we're going to talk about salvation. The Bible sets forth the idea that all mankind has sinned against God. Anyone who is of an accountable age and has chosen to do wrong uh, has sinned against God and is therefore lost in his sin. But in Christ, the scriptures teach that salvation can be found. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10, Paul said, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So Paul says that salvation is found in Christ Jesus. Peter in Acts chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 in talking about Jesus says, 
This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, referring to Jesus as the stone, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Notice here that Peter says that there is salvation in no other, only found in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. We can't get to the Father through Muhammad. We can't get to the Father through Confucius. We can't get to the Father through any man. Only Jesus is the way to the Father. And so salvation is found in Christ. Number two, and this goes, some of these words are synonymous but they bring out different ideas. Redemption is found in Christ. In Ephesians 1 and verse 7, it says that in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. When we think about the idea of redemption, we redeem things. We redeem coupons sometimes. When we get a coupon, we take it to a store and we redeem that coupon. The word redeem means to buy back. Literally, the store is buying back that coupon from you, and they buy it back by giving you a discount on your bill, and that's how they buy it back. And here, Paul points out that we are redeemed in Christ. Redeemed how? That means God buys us back. Well, that's the idea then that we have become slaves of sin, which the Scriptures talk about, Slaves of the devil, and God can buy us back through the blood of Christ. He takes us out of the grip of the devil, and in Christ, redeems us, buys us back from that destiny of eternal destruction and separation from God, but only in Christ. Number three, in Christ, we're described as new creatures. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Paul said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now again, we're going to talk about how we get into Christ. But this tells me that once I get into Christ, I am a new creation. I'm still the same person I was when I, uh, when I get into Christ. But in a sense, I'm also a new creation in that the old has passed away. Anything that I've done, all of my previous sins are gone. They've been forgotten by God. And what a blessing that is, that we can be a new creation in Christ. It doesn't matter. Uh, Many times we'll run into people who have the idea that they have been so wicked, so evil, that God would never want them, that God would never be willing to forgive them of what the things that they have done. And to that, we mention the Apostle Paul. Paul was a man who killed Christians. That was his joy. That was what he loved to do before he became a Christian. And yet God shows through Paul that there's nothing that he won't forgive if you come back to him. You can, have, you can be a new creation in Christ and walk in newness of life. Also, we read in Romans 8 and verse 1 that in Christ there is no condemnation to be found. Romans 8 and verse 1. I probably should have included chapter 7, the last verse of of chapter 7 in this, in Romans 7, where Paul says, O wretched man that I am, talking about him apart from Christ and the sin that he commits and how he's always doing the things that he knows he shouldn't do. But in Romans 8 and verse 1, he says, Now there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. This doesn't mean that we haven't sinned. This doesn't mean that we're denying that we've done wrong in the past. But what it means is, if we're in Christ, God no longer holds us accountable for those things that we've done wrong. And as long as we strive to continue to live faithfully to God, and we may stumble along the way, but as long as we continue to walk in the light and strive to do the will of God, there will be no condemnation when we stand before God. On the judgment day, there is no condemnation in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3 tells us that in Christ we have all spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. 
Now, we've already talked about one of the spiritual blessings that is found in Christ, and that is salvation. Okay, but there are many other spiritual blessings that are found in Christ. I think peace is certainly one of the big blessings, that peace that surpasses understanding by knowing that you're in a right relationship with God and that no matter what may happen in this life, God will get you through it and will reward you when this life is over. There's the joy that comes from having that peace and having that knowledge. That's a spiritual blessing as well. And those blessings are only found in Christ. And oh, what blessings they are. To think that God has prepared a place for us where there is no suffering, where there is no death and no tears, where we can go and enjoy being in the presence of God for all eternity. It's in Christ. Sanctification is also found in Christ. Let me define sanctification first of all. The word sanctify is very, it's from the same root word in the original language, the Greek, as the word holy. Something that is sanctified is something that has been made holy. And something that is holy or sanctified is something that has been set aside for God's purpose. It's been purified, it's been cleansed, and it has become holy so that it can be used in service to God. I think all of us understand that we need to be sanctified. We need to be holy individuals. We need to be purified and cleansed so that we can serve God. In 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2, Paul writes, as he opens this epistle, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brothers, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. That word saints there again is, is from the same root uh, as the word holy. We're sanctified so that we can become saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. We can be sanctified in Christ. And, and again, in the religious world nowadays, people have this idea that a saint was a super Christian. That a saint is somebody who, you know, wasn't just a normal Christian. They've done some extra things. You know, they, they, they stand above uh, other Christians. But here this passage tells us that if we are in Christ... We've been sanctified and we are saints. Never, if you're a Christian, never say, well, I'm no saint. You know, that's a common saying. I'm no saint. Well, if you're a Christian, you are a saint. Don't say that. You'll confuse people. We also know that in Christ we are reconciled. Again, this goes back to the idea that sin separates us from God. We become the enemy of God by our sin and there is a need to be reconciled, to be brought back at peace with God. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18, we read, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. So we are reconciled in Christ. If we are in Christ, we've been reconciled to God and, and back we're made at peace with God. Through Christ, if we're in Him. The scriptures also tell us that we are made complete or perfect in Christ. In Colossians 2 and verse 10, Paul says, You are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. We can rest assured that if we are in Christ, we are complete. We have in Christ and through Christ all that we need to be thoroughly equipped to every good work. He's given us His Word. He, so that we know His will. He's provided us with all that we need to live godly in this present world, and so we can be complete if we are in Him. He has given us all that we need if we study His Word and apply it to our lives. Also, we can abide in Him. We're told that we are to abide in Christ. Now, in John 15, Jesus gives a parable we refer to as the vine and the branches. And he points out that he is the vine and his followers are the branches. And he says in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. 
So we are to abide in Christ. We're to get into Christ and we're to abide there. What does it mean to abide in Christ? It, it means simply to walk according to His will. To live according to His teachings. To let His words guide us in our everyday lives. We should go through every day of our life with the situations we face. Asking that question that you know so well. What would Jesus do in this situation? What choice would Jesus have me to make when the choice is set before us to, to go right or to go left? What, what is it that Jesus would have me to do? Should I take that job? Should I not take that job? Uh, whatever it might be, what is it that the Lord would have me to do? And pray for wisdom that you get it right when you make that decision. It is in Christ where we can come into contact with the blood of Christ. We've already noticed Ephesians 1 and verse 7, but when we look at it again, it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. The Scriptures teach that it's the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. And here we read that it, when we're in Him, it's, it, it's the blood, we come into contact with that blood. It's when our sins are washed away, when we're in Christ. Also, we realize that in Christ is a place to labor. Now, what I mean by this is <clears throat> that there are a lot of people in the world who have the idea that they can sort of work their way through the pearly gates, so to speak. If they do enough good, if they are a moral person and try to live in a moral fashion, that God will allow them into heaven. Well, as we're going to see, it's only people who are in Christ. But once we are in Christ, that is when we can labor and be rewarded for our labors by God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our labor is not in vain in the Lord. It goes noticed. Remember those letters to the seven churches in Revelations chapter 2 and 3? Remember how many times in those letters, as Jesus is speaking to those churches, He says, I know. I know your works. I know what you're going through. I know your trials. I know your strengths. I know your weaknesses. I know. Here we read that when we're in the Lord, our labor is not in vain. But that also implies that if I'm not in the Lord, my labor is in vain. You see, I can't work my way into heaven. I might do a lot of good. I might help a lot of people. I might be a very moral person. But friend, if you're not in Christ, your labor is in vain. Because, as we're going to see, it's not good works that washes away sins. It's the grace of God and the blood of Jesus. And I have to come into contact with that blood. And I don't do that through good works. We're going to see how we do that. To be in Christ is to be in the church. I always find it interesting when someone says, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a member of the church. Many of you probably have talked with people like that who say, I'm a Christian, but I, I don't go to church I'm, or I'm not a member of any church. Well, scripturally speaking, you can't be a Christian and not be in the church because by definition, that's what the church is. The church is made up of Christians. It's not a building. It's not a physical structure. It is the baptized believers who... Uh, our servants of God. Ephesians 1 and verse 23, 22 and 23, we learn there that the church is the body. It's described as the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And, and speaking of Christ, it says He's put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body. So the church is the body of Christ. And we as individuals, Paul says in Romans 12 and verse 5, we being many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. And so the body of Christ is made up of many members. And Christians are those members that make up the body of Christ. And so if I am in Christ, 
If I'm in his body, that means I'm in the church. You can't be a Christian and not be a member of the Lord's church. It is in Christ that I will be blessed in death. In Christ that I will be blessed in death. Revelation 14 and verse 13. John writes, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Again, that, that blessing that comes at death, it's only found if we die in the Lord. We must be in the Lord and striving to do His will. And then finally, again, this goes right along with salvation and redemption, but it's eternal life is found in Christ. 1 John 5 and verse 11, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. So as we think about all that we've discussed, we realize that if there's one organization, if there's one place that I want to be, it's in Christ. That's where we need to be, is in Christ. So we have to ask the question then, how do we get there? How can we get into Christ where we can enjoy salvation and redemption? We can be that new creature. We can enjoy the spiritual blessings that are made there. We can labor and serve the Lord, and it's not in vain. Well, we have to obey the gospel. We have to become Christians. And therefore, these are the things that we have to do. Number one, we have to hear the word. We have to hear the word. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. We have to have faith in order to please God. Number two, we have to believe what we read. We have to believe in the deity of Jesus. We have to believe uh, that Jesus is the Son of God and that He came to this earth and died for our sins. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. We have to believe that He is who He claimed to be. Also, we're told that we have to repent. To To repent is to turn. We have to turn from sin. We can't continue to live Uh, the same lifestyle that we live maybe before we were a Christian. We have to turn from the sin that's in our life and strive to live according to His will. Acts 17 and verse 30. God now commands all men everywhere to repent of the sin in their life. We know also that we're told to confess our faith in Christ. A verbal confession that is to take place. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I have to confess my faith in Jesus, but I'm not yet in Christ. If I've done those things, boy, I'm I'm doing right. I have to hear, believe, repent, confess, but I'm not in Christ until I'm baptized. Well, preacher, baptism's a work. And we're not saved by works. I got that at the fair last week. It's a work. You're saying we have to work to be saved. And I'm not saying that baptism is a work. Is it a physical thing that we have to do? Yes. I have to be immersed. That's what the word baptism means. But it's not a work. I'm not trying to earn my way into heaven by being baptized. By being baptized, we are submitting ourselves to the will of God and demonstrating that submission by our action, by our obedience to His will. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Paul was told by Ananias in Acts 22, 16, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And then finally in Galatians 3 and verse 27, Here's the answer to our question. How do I get into Christ? As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. All those blessings are found in Christ. In order to get into Christ, I have to obey the gospel, which not only includes baptism, but hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, But you can do all of those things and be lost if you're not baptized. Because God has commanded us, 
Jesus commanded. We read Matthew 6, Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And the one who truly believes obeys. So friend, if you are here this morning and you've never been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, we offer you the opportunity to do that today. It's through baptism that we get into Christ. If you are not yet a Christian, make that decision today. Enjoy the blessings that come by being in Christ. We're about to sing a song. And if there are any here who would like to respond to the invitation to be baptized and put on Christ and get into Christ and into His church, you can do that as we sing. If, if there are any here who have already done that, but maybe you've allowed sin back into your life, you're not living the way that you should, or maybe you just need prayers of the church, you can also come forward as we stand and as we sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.